Let me just do a final check on the sound. That's all right. That's all right. Perfect. Okay. Good. We are alive. Uh, Bram, will you give me the signal to start? You can start, Olivia, so uh, everyone is entering the room. Ah, OK. OK, <laughs> so we're going to start now. Welcome to our session. This is the session they call Track A, Use Space Operational Aspects. Uh, my name is Olivia Nunes. I am an ATM expert at the Cesar Joint Undertaking. I myself have a background as an operational controller, so I'm very pleased to be uh, sharing exactly this session about the operational aspects. We have three excellent presenters, pres well, four presenters, three presentations today for you. And uh, well, just as a reminder, this is the third day, so I think everybody knows, but please post the questions on the Q&A on WOVA, even if you are joining on Zoom. And uh, you can chat um, as you like, but please the questions on the Q&A because otherwise we may miss them. We are going to try to be a little bit careful with the time so that we don't go over time, uh, which is quite easy to do when you have uh, interesting material like we do today. And anyway, without further ado, I, I want to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is, uh, I hope I get this right, Adriana Andriva Mori. She is a researcher in the Japan Airspace Exploration Agency, and, and she's going to be presenting us on, on their paper that's uh, actually looking at how to combine, how to exploring, how to combine operationally drones and helicopters in, in emergency response, which is a problem that's, that's actually a problem today that uh, I think is already being faced today. Ad Adriana, please, uh, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia, for the introduction. Let me start by sharing my slides. Let me try that again. Uh, can you see my slides? Perfect. Excellent, so we can start. Thank you everyone for joining the session today. I'm Adriana Andreeva Mori, a researcher at JAXA, and today I will be speaking about management of operations under visual flight rules in UTM for disaster response missions. Now, this work is part of JAXA and NASA collaboration. So before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my JAXA co-authors, Koji Oga, Keiji Kobayashi, and uh, Yoshinori Okuno, and our NASA colleagues, Jeffrey Humola, Marcus Johnson, who's with us today, and uh, Parimal Koparticao for their valuable contributions to the current research. So um, what happens in disaster response? During disasters, damaged infrastructure often prevents ground vehicles from accessing geographic areas. So to facilitate an effective response, disaster operations often rely on aircraft for reconnaissance, search and rescue, and supply delivery missions. Recent advances have shown possibilities for small UAS or drones as well. However, these UAS uh, and manned aircraft cannot operate uh, together in the same airspace. So this vehicle integration and coordination pose many major challenges which we try to address in our work. Um, what we propose in particular is shown here. So we propose the use of mission planning and traffic management technology to address the challenges of coordination between manned aircraft and U.S. during a disaster response operation. So this work investigates concepts for defining and sharing operation volumes to describe the intended flight plan of the helicopter mission operating under VFR supporting disaster response missions. These operation volumes will also be communicated with the U.S. traffic management or the UTM system to enable strategic deconfliction and coordination between manned and unmanned aircraft. Here we describe two main pieces of our work. Design of for the operation volumes to match the characteristics of the VFR operations and the flight test which we conducted earlier. 
Let me start with a brief overview of the systems involved. So the first one is the UTM. The objectives of UTM are to enable a safe and scalable approach to support the use of small US operations at low altitude, providing flexibility in use of airspace where possible and structure where necessary. So the UTM technology development assessment focused on a common situational awareness display, air, airspace deconfliction, operation prioritization, and coordination of dynamic changes to operation intent. These capabilities support the extension, the extension of this UTM to disaster response. And now a less um, perhaps known system is the DNET or JAXA's Disaster Relief Aircraft Information Sharing Network. So the DNET systems assist in the collection and sharing of disaster information through the uh, integrated operations of aircraft, US and satellites. And the objectives of DNET is efficient uh, acquisition of data from multiple sources, analysis of the data and optimal allocation in flight flight trajectories. So, so disasters can be supported. What brought UTM and DNET together? So although US have been used in DNET, a need was identified to further increase safety and promote the greater applications of a US to disaster response. To that end, a collaboration was established in 2016 between JAXA and NAXA uh, to conduct research investigating the integration of the DNET and UTM systems. Two years later, in 2018, a joint flight test was conducted in Ahime Prefecture that was part of a national large-scale disaster drill, and this has highlighted the importance of heterogeneous manned and unmanned operations in disaster response. This test, however, also revealed several challenges of uh, the current operation concepts and technologies, and one of these was the discrepancies between the interpretation of operation volumes within UTM. As a means to provide these separations uh, between operations, UTM requires a definition of spatial and temporal volumes, uh, de which describe each US trajectory. Given that most US operate by the following, uh, by following like pre-programmed waypoints, these operations can be relatively easily defined. It's much more difficult with VFRs because the flight plans contain only limited information. So what we propose is the use of mission information. In particular, we define three common mission dependent volume designs. So point to point movement, reconnaissance and search and rescue. Um, the point to point flight segments here can be controlled either manually or by the helicopter's autopilot. In both cases, however, few deviations from the route are expected. Um, so the lateral allowance of the operation volume is relatively small. The other mission type is reconnaissance. So with reconnaissance missions, uh, they're mostly manually controlled and therefore associated with more uncertainty as they might include deviations from the planned trajectory. So according to pre flight interviews with disaster responders, the pilot often navigates by tracking landmarks such as river and highways, for example. So therefore, for reconnaissance missions, operations volumes were defined to follow these geographic la landmarks like the one shown here. The definition of landmark-based operation volumes for flights under VFR is novel within the UTM concept. And um, this was something we introduced here. The last one is search and rescue. So the third disaster relief mission here uh, was modeled as a circular flight along the point of interest. So this is uh, the point where supposedly the, vacu the evacuee was waiting uh, for the aircraft to arrive. So here we have point to point movement, reconnaissance and search and rescue. So um, how do we decide our test to uh, confirm the assumptions with the volume designs. In this figure, you can see the interaction among the aircraft, DNET systems, and the UTM systems. So prior to takeoff, the operation volumes designed manually in DNET were sent from JAXA's DNET system to NAXA's UTM system as an operation plan. Um, and once the operation was received, the UTM system verified known conflicts were present and accepted the plan. Uh, Real-time data was also available for both DNET and UTM system. What about the flight test preparation themselves? So the main part of the test took place um, in civil test area on the north of Chofu Airdrome, which is in uh, Tokyo. Uh, and once in the test area, each mission was related to one volume. So you have one mission per one volume. 
Pre-flight estimates of the volume exit and entry times were uh, determined based on discussions with the pilot and uh, an additional buffer that was added for uncertainties. So to simulate more uncertainties, um, some of the missions were given to the pilots by a researcher on board without prior notice. So they were so uh, called pop-up missions as well. So let's uh, move on to the results. Um, we collected data using telemetry from the aircraft and the data exchanges between DNET and UTM. Prior to takeoff, as I mentioned, the helicopter plan, flight plan was submitted to UTM, and while in flight, real-time data was available through DNET's onboard mission support system and could be followed through the ground uh, DNET uh, mission support system as well. So, what are our results? In total, the helicopter went outside of its operation volume on three occasions. So we had 15 volumes and uh, three times uh, the helicopter violated these uh, volumes. The violations are referred to A, B, and C in this figure. So the blue, not, the blue dots are, uh, indicate the helicopter was flying in performance with the expected volume, and the red dots show the positions when the helicopter was not conforming to its flight volume. The first violation, A, happened during a reconnaissance mission in Operation Volume Segment 8, where it was non-conforming for about 55 seconds. So here, the, actually, the transition uh, to rock was observed, and this is a final state in UTM. The second violation here, B, uh, happened for just two seconds. Oops, sorry. It happened for two seconds only when the helicopter was leaving Operation Volume Segment 10 uh, and entering segment 11. And the last one, violation C, uh, happened as the helicopter left the volume for an unplanned mission and returned uh, 190 seconds later, so three minutes uh, later. So um, in this presentation, due to the time constraints, we are going to focus on the first violation, but you can find more details, more details uh, on the other violations in the paper as well. So violation A, occurred during the reconnaissance mission along the river. In this Operation Volume Segment 8, the helicopter was flying north, so the entire trajectory was shifted to the west along the river. Why to the west? It's because the main pilot was seated in the right seat and flew the helicopter so that the river was always visible from the lower right window for easy reference. The pilot monitored and confirmed the helicopter's relative location to the river visually, so he did not he have any other uh, tools. The distance between the helicopter and the river is shown in the figure in the middle. The blue line shows the distance between the vehicle and the river. The magenta line shows the distance between the volume edge and the river. So the black uh, dotted line shows the 0.5 nautical mile threshold proposed by the pilots uh, based on their experience. As you can see, the distance between the helicopter and the river varied between 0.28 and 0.46 nautical miles. So when even when um, the vehicle was non-conforming, it was within the 0.5 threshold. Therefore, if we had set the edges um, at least 0.5 nautical miles, no violation would have occurred. This already, however, highlighted the need for more tools to help um, the pilot with their situational awareness. Now let me move on to the use of airspace um, and how we access this uh, data. So we extracted and uh, submitted and begin end times for each operation volume and plotted the times in which positions were reported within each volume as shown here. Uh, the horizontal axis is the time and the vertical axis shows the volume number. So you can see that for each volume, uh, the pre-flight estimate of the flight time within each volume is shown as a bold black line and the volume begin and end time submitted to UTM are shown um, as well. So one issue that we noticed is that since disaster response includes many uncertainties in the mission goals and trajectories, a reconnaissance or transfer mission, for example, can be temporarily interrupted by a detail search. So here in volume 13, for example, when the helicopter was flying along the river, conducted a reconnaissance mission, the crew was asked to confirm the state of a building. So in order to do so, the pilot executed a turn similar to a circular holding pattern, thus taking extra space. 
Um, and I'm going to move on to some mar remarks on the pilot's uh, debrief and recommendations that they provide is from an operational aspect. So both pilots that participated, participated in the flight um, have experience with various rotorcraft and dis disaster response missions. So they also participated in our volume design. So during the flight, the co-pilot co here, sorry, the co here, the co-pilot here, the one sitting on the left, uh, was looking at the operation volume showing the mission flight booklet and provided oral advisories to the main pilot. So these advisories help him uh, stay within the flight uh, volume assigned to a certain mission. So even though the pilot had awareness of each volume, he did not rely on any advisory displays to, uh, to, um, to remain within this volume. And this is an, a challenge that still remains to be solved. What about the the comments regarding that uh, conformance. So pilots uh, di discussed with us that it was not very difficult. It was relatively straightforward to comply with the temporal aspect of the volume uh, because from their regular operations, they're used to making speed adjustments to meet time constraints and this experience contributed to the successful flight plan, uh, maintaining the expected times we believe. So with respect to the um, instance of conformance violations, however, the feedback from the pilot suggested that the tool to visualize um, the trajectory and the volume, such as let's say head mounted displays, could augment the operation volume with a visual image to increase positional awareness and reduce the likelihood of conformance violations. So alerts could also be provided um, and they can be also uh, auditory cues as well. So it will be very uh, useful to have such a tools, but predicting uh, such a um, conformance event in the near future is not as straightforward as we would hope for and more work is needed in that area. We also discussed uh, the necessity to be able to modify the volumes in flight uh, as this flexibility is uh, crucial in disaster response operations. Uh, they also, pilots also told us that they would like to release the volume, which is a feature not present yet. So if you are finished with your mission, you should be able to release the airspace for other users. A unique feature of VFR operation is the role of landmarks. So the flight test proved that large river railroads and highways provided very clear guidance if they were not impacted by the disaster, obviously. Um, so bridges are very easy to see, as you uh, can notice in this picture, but they are very difficult to identify. So um, such situation awareness uh, aids will also help with um, further mission compliance as well. Um, let me conclude our talk today uh, with a quick uh, wrap up. So the flight test conducted in December 2019, examining this concept of landmark based design of operation volumes when applied to manned flight operations under VFR um, within the DNET and UTM integrated environment. So test results and pilot feedback suggest that the approach taken to operation planning may have helped the pilots maintain conformance with their operation volumes. And this conformance is important from the integration of manned air assets and UAS within a UTM supported disaster environment. There were also challenges, however, um, and they would need future work as well. The results also highlighted the need for better understanding and further research into the trade space between pilot flexibility and more structured environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adriana. Um, we we have um, a a question for you. It's uh, if you you know it's it's um, it's a question about when when the co-pilot is is monitoring, yeah the the assigned like the nominal flight volume. So you have to to follow to follow the route. Um, is is that a realistic mode of operation? Actually, that that you should you know 
the, 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 the two, two pilots are there and uh, they're there to do a job, which is, you know, to to, right. to actually monitor. And this seems like a, a lot of work with the booklet and, and trying to, mm -hmm. especially we're talking here of a conformance that's, you know, forgive me for the term, almost RMP conformance, because, you know, when it went out of the volume, it's I like agree. 0. Yes. 0.5 out of, of, right. of this. Right. Is, is this uh, realistic? Um, thank you for the question. Marcus, would you like to take this or shall I uh, elaborate on that? Maybe I can start and Marcus can add later, if that's okay. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, what I'd like to mention here is that the volumes were designed in a very severe manner. So um, these margins that we were using when designing the volumes, we are aware that they are relatively small margins and they will require a lot of precision on the operations. However, what we found out also is that um, the visual aids used by the pilots, the co-pilots are very similar to what they would do in a regular uh, mission as well. So even if they fly um, an operation without this booklet, they would still um, look out of the window, look for the landmarks, look for um, which would be close or actually further away and use them uh, as guidance as they fly the aircraft. So we didn't actually uh, experience uh, any untreatable and unacceptable increase in workload uh, when we interviewed the pilots after that. Bec one thing to, uh, to add to the importance of the briefing prior to the flight. So they were already, they have already acknowledged themselves with these volumes prior to the flight and they participated in the volumes design as well. So that could be a thing to notice. But then again, you're right. Um, we believe that if they could provide such good um, accuracy just with a paper booklet, then had they had, let's say, any uh, head mount display or even a tool showing them the volume in real time, that would have led to, to even better results. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, kind of a follow up question. Are we looking here at, you know, traditional VFR is, uh, you know, basically departure destination and, uh, you know, free, <laughs> no free route. Uh, and uh, are we looking here at, at some kind of hybrid so that you have to determine your route and conform to it somehow? Is this like an evolution to some kind of hybrid flight rules? Is that the way you would see it? Um, yes, we actually believe that the mission is very important. So it's very important to know where you're flying. And this is very unique to VFR operation of uh, let's say disaster response or uh, any other what we would see in the future in the urban air mobility. So usually with the civil aircraft, we only have transport missions on what we call here the point to point movement. Uh, there's much less of a variation there. Uh, but once we are in this VFR uh, world, um, there is more uncertainty and there's also more um, consideration to be taken. However, one advantage to notice here is that each of these missions have a particular goal. So with this particular goal, we can use that information to aid us in the trajectory prediction. We are currently doing more work on the trajectory prediction for each of these missions so that we can build a better volume around it. Well, thank you. Then, you know, it's just uh, we have time for a brief uh, just last question is that um, you know, and uh, in the audience, we, we have a question of about whether you consider the interagency, the IATF protocols. Okay, um, so there are several directions that can be considered for um, bringing this to a more standardized, perhaps, uh, level, I would say. And um, I think that it is we, the order is slightly reversed. So first we would have to make sure that uh, the proposed method can be generalized enough to cover more missions. And when we, once we identify the parameters relevant for that, uh, we can proceed further. 
Okay, so thank you very much. We had a question, uh, just a generic question that's uh, not really for you, for us. You could you share the paper. So all the papers will be available in the in the SITS website, as well as the presentations. And so thank you, Adriana. Um, I am going to welcome on stage, if you can turn on your camera, please, uh, Jishi Zeng. I hope I pronounced this correctly. So our next presenter uh, from Singapore, we, we uh, can you, um, yeah. we can only okay. see the top of your head, so if you can tilt the camera oh. a little bit. Um, so she's going to be presenting to us about how you can do some kind of translation into, if you have a drone port, uh, how would you organize a, an arrival sequence, like a, like kind of an aerodrome circuit? I don't know if that would be a good interpretation. <laughs> so uh, she is, uh, is, is working on her PhD, am I correct, on, on this topic precisely? So, Yishi, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen. So, can you see the full screen? We can see it, Yixi, no problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Olivia, and thank you for your introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Yixi from NTO Singapore. Firstly, I want to thank my co-author, Greg, and my supervisor, Prof Wu. Today, I will be giving an overview of our research regulating arrival UAV flows between the L matrix and the drone port using a dynamic carousel circuit. I start by giving some background material as well as, well as program statement followed by two concepts related to this research. Then we will look at the research structure, methodology, results, and conclusion. UAVs or drones have attracted great attention in many areas, such as school er uh, passenger delivery, surveillance, search and rescue, sports events, and agriculture monitoring. Each application is, is, is expected to be prevalent and gradually change the conventional operations. According to the statistic uh, estimated by CESA, the air traffic flow will grow to tens of millions of annual flights by 2050. Figure one compares the impact on the airspace of manned and unmanned flights in the unit of flight hour and distance. By 2050, the drone operation for densely populated usage in very low level airspace will be 250 million hours, which, which will be seven times of the manned aviation operations in controlled airspace. Although many organizations provide concepts and uh, Overview of future drone operations and the restrict drone operations in special use airspace. There still are many challenges and hazards that must be resolved. When we look at the commercial aviation accidents happened uh, in recent 20 years, we see that most of the accidents happened during the approach and landing phases. Just like commercial aviation, remotely piloted aircraft system, a subcategory of the unmanned aircraft system, also has a similar distribution of accidents and uh, regarding different flight phases. The study shows that takeoff landing approach phases accounts for a large proportion of RPAS accidents and incidents. Another issue is air space congestion issue. As increment of drone operation is expected in a near future, it is likely to encounter congestion in urban airspace. Unlike traditional air traffic and road traffic, Unmanned traffic has a highly higher density and a more complex operating environment. Therefore, the airspace congestion issue is another barrier for future drone operations. For conventional aircraft, airport is a key determinant in the air transport system to increase traffic capacity. Same for drone operation, infrastructure will be a significant factor to the two potential issues. The in Initiative aim of this research is to promote the secure use of low altitude airspace, especially during approach and departure phases for a wide range of application of drones. This research addressed the issue that arise that, that will arise if the large scale full autonomous drone operations are implemented in the near future. Aiming at managing approaching and departing drones safely and efficiently, we conceive two concepts drone port and the carousel circuit. One of the projects in our institute has done many studies on advanced technologies used in the future drone operations, 
such as detect and avoid command control drug fencing and L metrics. Figure four shows the proposal for the traffic management of drones in future urban airspace. Drone port will be part of this traffic system. So drone port, similar to the airport, drone port provides facility to store, maintain, and manage drones. Each level of drone port contains takeoff and landing pads used to charge drones, install, unload parcels, pick up drop off passengers. Considering that drones are susceptible to wind disturbance, the profile of the drone port is designed to be cylinder to compensate wind effect from different direction. The detailed view of an illustrative drone port is shown in this figure. Given the expected large number of various types of drones in the near airspace around the drone port, there is a need to have efficient air traffic management to control the departure and the arrival of drones. Similar to the holding pattern introduced in the Metropolis project, we propose a traffic pattern for drone port called carousel circuit. Carousel circuits can be multi-level in order to split the heavy floor traffic, a heavy traffic floor into different carousel circuits. If a drone is assigned to a landing gate in the lower floor, it can follow the carousel circuit in the corresponding level and uh, wait for the taxi clearance. Between each level of the carousel circuit, proper traffic rules should be applied to avoid congestion and collision. The main stream of traffic is from L metrics. L metrics is a UTM system with sense and avoid capability covering whole very low level airspace in urban areas. Figure six shows an initial design of the multi-layer multi and a double lane circuit configuration. These slides show how sales pattern changes during the day which days of the week are business online and how sales trends look across the whole year. We can see that the e-commerce demand in peak hour is much more higher than that in off hour. Higher demand means the, that the drone port needs a larger capacity to meet the increasing demand. Therefore, a larger carousel circuit should be chosen. In this situation, a dynamic carousel circuit is a, applicable and conducive for a drone port with growing demand. Its radius will be adjusted based on the predicted demand. The stru uh, research structure is shown in this slide. Our previous study uh, introduced drone port concept and uh, estimated the future demand of drones. The forecasted demand is used in this research. To validate the dynamic carousel circuit, we conduct a simulation about the drone port landing procedures. The simulation consists of three phases of the arrival arriving drones, approach phase, queue phase, and land, landing phase. In the beginning of this simula uh, simulation, the incoming drones are assumed to appear around the drone port according to Poisson distribution with a certain arrival rate. This arrival rate is indicated by the length of the time probability distribution between two drone arrivals. TVLA is the arrival time of the width drone at fixed point L on the L matrix network. GV is a, a sighted landing gate. BVL pry is the residual battery level of the width drone at the fixed point L. During approaching phase, the main stream of uh, traffic is from the L matrix and they will appear in the same orientation at their assigned gates. The slow tone, the carousel circuit are rep represented by many virtual blocks circulating around side the carousel circuit. In each time step, the positions of these virtual blocks will be refreshed and predicted by their moving speed while ensuring safe separation. The main objective in this phase is selecting available virtual blocks to the approaching drums from the L matrix so we can minimize the, the total travel time and the battery consumption. Hungarian algorithm is implemented into solve this assignment Program. The assignment constitutes an independent set of cost metrics. The cost metrics value consists of two elements. Tau XY is the travel time for drone V from fixed point L on the L matrix network to the position of virtual block J on the carousel circuit at time T. VX prime is the res uh, residual battery level of drone V. As shown in this figure, Approaching points from the L matrix network forming a circle 
illustrated as the outer ring. The inner ring represents the character circuit. A drone exits the L matrix along the direction pointing to the center of the character circuit and drawing the circuit following the virtual block moving angle. And its approach trajectory is computed using qubit interpolation. After drawing the queue on the character circuit, the drone will take a circular motion together with other occupied and unoccupied virtual blocks. In this phase, the character circuit acts as an approaching pattern to reduce the collision risk. In order to adapt to weather conditions, the time-based separation is implemented in determining the positions as well as the number of virtual blocks. In this phase, the drone will be allowed to exit the circuit only when two conditions are met. The first condition is this drone is at the designated metering fixed point. The second condition is the landing gate is available. Once the drone leaves the circuit, it will approach the landing gate following a planned cubic trajectory shown in this figure. The outer ring represents the character circuit and the inner ring is the drone port for cake containing many openings for landing gates. As shown in this figure, a drone exits the carousel circuit around its velocity vector and approach the landing gate lining up with the virtual runway. Each landing gate is equipped with a simple MMC queuing system. Besides the three phases, we also introduce a, a battery endurance estimation uh, model in this simulation. This is because a safe and efficient drone port operation should include battery monitoring to prevent out of battery situation. This model is developed based on the endurance as estimation model designed in Huang's paper. However, we improved the original model to calculate the uh, restroom endurance of a multi rotor drone with the remaining battery level as an input. The pseudo code of this model is shown here. This model can calculate the remaining endurance of, the, of a drone. This remaining endurance will be one of the constraints in the following optimization model. A large circuit increases the delay time span in the queuing system, while a small circuit reduces the throughput. An optimal radius is therefore a significant requirement to carry out an efficient drone port operation. This optimization model aims to find the optimum circuit radius, flight speed along the character circuit, and the, the circuit altitude above the target landing gate. This is the objective function. The first three phases, uh, the turns, are the travel time costs for drone V during the approaching phase, queuing phase, and landing phase. While the last, last three terms associated with a cost-efficient beta uh, represent the battery consumption for drone V during those three phases. In this optimization algorithm, two constraints con associated with the uh, simulation are considered. First, firstly, the fail number equal to zero. The value of fail means the number of drones failed to be assigned a virtual block. Secondly, the remaining battery level of the landed drone is higher than 5%. Then we carry out numerical analysis for the simulation model and the optimization algorithm. GA is applied to perform the optimization model. This research aims to validate the dynamic character circuit used in drone port operation and determine the optimal radius of the character circuit, the flight speed of drones moving on the circuit, and the altitude of the circuit. Each of them has an upper limit and a lower limit. Table 1 lists the important parameters used in the numerical tests. According to the results from our previous study, we can estimate the peak out demand of the delivery drones in a most crowded drone port. In this situation, we assume that the carousel circuit has three levels and two lengths. So in each level of the carousel circuit, the demand is about 5,000 drones per hour. Each landing gate follows the, follows the mm 2 queuing rule. The results from this optimization algorithm are in table two. The first line is the optimal result. The second line is the non-optimal result. These two results are shown in figure nine. The gap between the red line and the blue line indicates the filling. The green line in the lower plot B is maintained at higher level compared to the plot A. You can see a slightly difference between 
uh, these two plots on the green line. This means in non-optimized situation, the carousel circuit is always fully occupied. Moreover, we also carry out some analysis with higher demand, used the same specification for 6,000 arrival rate and 7,000 arrival rate. The results are listed in table two also. In the case of 7,000 arrival rate, the result has uh, 467 fillions. However, a demand of 6,000 arrival drones has no fillions, but the total travel time cost increases a lot. The results show that a carousel circuit with fixed radius is not efficient and effective to accommodate drones with fluctuating hourly demand. This optimization proves the possibility of the dynamic carousel circuit. Given an estimated incoming flow, a carousel circuit with a changeable radius is able to reduce delay and energy consumption compared to the carousel circuit with a fixed radius. This study introduced a service facility called Drumport, divergent from recent trend. The design of Drumport focuses more on air traffic control. Therefore, we introduced the dynamic carousel circuit with a changing radius that can accommodate the growing demand for future drones. The carousel circuit is designed to act, act as a traffic pattern that manages drones coming in and coming out of the drone port. Based on this concept, a simulation model and an optimization algorithm were developed. As a complement to our uh, current study, future work will look into multi-level and multi lane circuits with transition rules applied between each level. Moreover, the weather uncertainty will be considered in the simulation in the future. Mm, thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer that. Uh, thank you very much, Ishii. Uh, you may want to turn on your camera. We do have quite a few questions. The, okay. the, f the first one, uh, that was posted is well. What happens if you know the the drone gets into the into the drone port and it, it sorry into into the circuit and then finally it reaches the landing spot and then there's a missed approach? How would that be handled? Oh, okay. Actually, in our study, we uh if the if the drone missed the uh the metering point, desired the metering point. Actually, they can uh, have um, one more round along the carousel circuit. But we try to avoid this situation because it's really uh, battery consumption and the uh, time consumption. OK, and then uh, we had a question about about where you put the drone port. I mean, what, oh. did, what did you did you do you have any insight on on where drone ports should be and you know how high and 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 if, you know you selected a flight speed I think of ten meters per second. What's the background for that? And uh, would would be a, a variety of flight speeds be uh, you know something that could be accommodated? Mm, actually, it's a, a lot of questions. Let me <laughs> uh, answer it first by first. Uh, for the drone port allocation, uh, it's our previous study. So we have papers on the drone port location. We are uh, used uh, Singapore as a case study. So in Singapore, we tried. Uh, we found that we have we have seven drone ports, and uh, the distribution of drone ports uh, are also shown in that paper. So um, actually, the link of my previous study is in my CSR paper. If you have interesting, you can check it out. And uh, the second question is the height, the uh, height of the drone port. Actually, we have, uh, to be honest, we don't have a, a correct number for the height of a uh, drone port because uh, now we assume that uh, in a cloudy drone port, we have such number of drones that need to be accommodated in these drone ports. Then we uh, estimate the size of a small drone, small drones, like maybe every drone need to have a four meter square, square meters uh, pad, a landing pad to charge it or to uh, accommodate it. So then uh, 
we still use Singapore as a case study. Singapore is a small country, so the land is quite expensive and we need to save the land. So we assume that the height of the drone pole will be 10 le levels. And according to the number of drone, uh, drone demand we found in our previous study, then we can estimate the size of the drone pole like to have 15 meters. It's a roughly estimation. Uh, all right, thank you. We we do have more more questions. Um, okay. One about you know general there there are multiple questions. I'll try to make you know bundle them together about the safety. Um, you know mm -hmm. the, you know the, the five thousand drones per hour incorporates operational safety margins. What would be the domino effect if there is a serious incident at the drone port? How would that be handled? Have you considered the the safety aspects in this in this work? Mm. Uh, actually, we didn't look into the safety aspects really, but the drone port, one of the uh, objective of the drone port is to uh, avoid the, some congestion and collision. So it's tried to make the drone port operation safe and efficient. And the drone port is not very near to the like public area. So similar to the airport is located uh, uh, far away from the urban area. So it's more safe, uh, it's safer for the public. So if you need to see the safety aspect of the drone operation, it's, I think <laughs> it's, not our, uh, it's not in our research aim. <laughs> so maybe in the future we'll look at it, but uh, now we uh, this drone port and character circuit based on some assumption and that the drone port trying to have a safe operations. Okay, thank you. Another question is about the wind. So the carousel mm -hmm. direction, like you, you said, meant it depends on the wind. So how how is that? Uh, how do you set up the direction depending on the wind? What happens if the wind changes? Would you have like kind of stop to the carousel or, and then is there an effect like a wind shear effect of, of the building of the actual drone port building that mm -hmm. in the arrival and departure? Thanks for this question. It's really a good point. Okay, the wind we uh, will uh, try to research on it in the future study is including the weather uncertainty. Now we assume the carousel circuit is moving in a clockwise direction. So it's still based on the assumption. So this is uh, one of the uh, our research uh, future studies. Mm, uh yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then may maybe we have time for one, one last question is more from the business aspect. You know, who who would operate this? Is this like the drone port operator? Who would pay for, for this, um, you know, management and organization of the of this system? How what's your business view? OK, it depends on the level of autonomy of the drone port. Actually, we had uh, we had a level of autonomy of the drone port. So in each level of autonomy, the different type of uh, like uh, whether the pilot should be involved in the drone port, uh, some, uh, drone port operation or only the computer will be involved. So it, it really depends on the level of, of autonomy, like the autonomous vehicle. Okay, so thank you very much, Ishi. Uh, best of luck with okay, finishing your, you. your PhD with this interesting topic. And, uh, okay, you know, thank we, you so much. <laughs> we are on, on to our last presentation. We have uh, two presenters, uh, so uh, both from, from Spain, although I think one of them may not be Spanish. He's also doing a PhD in TU Delft. That's, um, so we have Marina um, from INECO, Marina Jimenez. And we have Dominic uh, Janish, you're both presenting, correct? Hey, Marina? Yeah, and Dominic Janish is-, uh, is Sorry, yes, we uh, are, yeah. Okay, and uh, I think he's, he's from Crida, right? And also start doing a PhD in, in, in TU Delft, I think, uh, I, I don't know if it's that's related to this work. So, um, 
they're going to be uh, uh, presenting to us a, about how to organize the, the drone traffic. And you know, we were looking at drone ports. Now we're looking at actually navigating uh, in a city and the constraints in a city and how that would work in specifically in a city that's not like all perpendicular like uh, streets. So uh, Marina and Dominique, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Olivia. Sorry for not responding before. I had some issues connecting my, my audio. So thank you all for, for attending this session. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Olivia. So we're going to go into the actual aspect of collision risk and how that would affect demand and capacity balancing. This is a paper which has been published as part of the DACUS project, which is an exploratory research project funded by uh, CESAR. And in particular, uh, Krida and uh, Ineco are the ones who will be presenting uh, this paper. But uh, from our side, uh, from my point of view, um, as also the program, uh, the, the project managers uh, from Krida, we will also just briefly provide you with an introduction on where to situate our work within the work that we're doing as part of DACUS. And then my colleague Marina will take over the more technical aspects of the uh, collision risk uh, work that we were performing as part of this uh, as part of the experiments in our project. So in order to situate yourself a bit more into what is what it is that we're actually trying to achieve with this work, uh, just a brief introduction into the DACUS project. We're looking at developing a demand and capacity balancing concept for use space. And uh, we're doing so with the help of quite a large consortium of companies, both from the industry as well as research. And we're also very happy to have on board uh, the city of Toulouse to provide us with input from, from their site, as well as uh, drone operators in Iceland, um, who were also providing us with a lot of operational input uh, to this entire concept. Now, in order to situate yourself a bit more about what it actually means to incorporate collision risk as part of demand and capacity balancing, I would like to just briefly highlight a sort of uh, conceptual example. So um, bear in mind any type of urban airspace, uh, which would be activated for you to use in, in use space, well, of course, depending on the types of missions that you can provide there, a, be a specific set of demand for UAV operations within uh, any given airspace over the city. Now, depending on the types of business opportunities that this uh, provides, there will be, of course, higher demand. But uh, capacity is, of course, not uh, unlimitless. You know, you have to have a certain type of uh, maximum uh, operating volume within this predefined airspace. So really the role of demand and capacity balancing as it is also very much established in air traffic management is obviously to balance the demand uh, and the capacity levels. Now, what we at DACUS are doing is looking at several ways to sort of uh, apply this concept towards the use space, given that the, um, the operations of UAVs will be much different from existing air traffic management. And uh, we're trying to do so by looking into several means of managing demand and capacity by, for instance, providing delays or rerouting UAVs around a capacity constraint um, area, which is very similar to air traffic management, but also looking at changing the structure itself within the airspace, which is capacity constraint, uh, in order to increase the flow of air traffic and as such, uh, increase the capacity if the demand requires it. And if it becomes necessary, of course, some missions might also need to be excluded from access to, to airspace. We're building this concept on a set of principles. First and foremost, of course, to maintain safety. Here, there's a number that I would like to uh, like you to keep in mind, which is one times 10 to the power of minus six. So one in a million fatalities, literally like human fatalities per flight hour as a, as a reference to uh, set sort of the, the safety level. But also we want to facilitate uh, use space operations as much as possible within this framework. So our idea is even if it is necessary to, to change a bit the, the uh, capacity structure, uh, we would like to minimize restrictions as much as possible. And if we do need to implement restrictions, uh, we would prioritize those which allow the UAV operators to um, complete their mission uh, objectives. You can find more uh, about this concept that we're developing uh, on the DACUS website, but for the purpose of this paper, and now we're going back into what it is that we're trying to show today as part of our work that we're performing, is we would like to look into the role of how do we actually define capacity for urban use space airspace. From our analysis, what we found is that capacity for use space depends on a series of factors. Uh, one, for instance, would be the uncertainty of drone missions, because we're looking here into the future, so demand and capacity balancing is usually done before the mission actually takes place. So uncertainty plays a relatively big role in the definition of which uh, um, 
VCB measures we would need to take. Moreover, given the low operating altitudes of these vehicles, we're also including noise and visual nuisance into this concept. So to have uh, also the citizens' uh, needs and requirements sort of covered as part of the capacity definition. Of course, first and foremost, the safety thresholds which are established for any given area of operation and uh, collision risk among vehicles, uh, which of course drives sort of the meeting or not of the safety thresholds. All of this together, we define well, we define capacity based on the conjunction of these elements. And within DACOS, we are now in the process of modeling all of these elements and testing them in a series of situ uh, simulations. One of the simulations that we have done is the, precisely the one that we're presenting today, which looks uh, into the role of collision risk uh, in the capacity definition for U space. Now, to provide this in a bit more of a uh, schematic way, uh, collision risk is just one element of several to identify any types of imbalances. And I'm just going to briefly walk you through the high level steps, uh, which we are following as part of this project. First and foremost, as you've already seen in the previous slide, we need to quantify the demand uh, and also quantify the uncertainty that is associated with it prior to actually executing the mission and characterize the drone missions based on which trajectories they will be likely, likely be taking, what their 4D uh, trajectories are and how large the uncertainties are for their missions. So the mission plan here is really important for us in order to actually perform this work. Once we have that element, there are three parallel uh, models in this case, which are, which are working. Uh, we are going to focus now in particular on the collision risk assessment, which essentially calculates the cumulative risk of collision among UAVs within a given airspace to identify what the overall risk of causing fatal accidents or injuries to people on the, on the ground are. And then we compare that in the third step with uh, defined capacity thresholds, which may not only depend on collision risk, but also, for instance, noise or visual impact, uh, which is then fed from the social impact model uh, that you can see just below. If it does become necessary to perform uh, demand and capacity balancing, uh, part three is then where we would imp uh, implement and check a series of solutions in which we can increase uh, capacity or regulates demand uh, if necessary. So this at very high level is uh, what we've tried to assess as part of this, uh, of this research. In particular for this paper, we're going to focus on point two, which is the assessment of collision risk. And I'm now going to give the word to my colleague Marina uh, for explaining a bit more of the work that was performed in modeling collision risk. Marina? Uh, yes, thank you, Dominic. Well, here, uh, well, here, uh, it is presented the formula we have followed to, to assess the number of, of fatal injuries to third parties on the ground. That is the parameter we have uh, used to set the maximum capacity of an aerospace. This, is, this parameter is stated by uh, Jarus in the SORA methodology, and they say, said that in one minus six fatalities per flight hour. And the objective of our um, model and our experiment is keep the the level of safety uh, below uh, this the this uh, value and for that we apply the formula presented here uh, we obtain the number of fatalities on the ground by multiplying these three terms uh, first uh, we have the collision plus failure risk. Uh, we obtain this risk uh, generating different random scenarios with different uh, trajectory samples in order to obtain, uh, to, to estimate the, um, the risk of a scenario. For that, we use a Monte Carlo approach. Then uh, the probability of injuring a person due to a collision, it will depend on the, the population density on the ground. And this is going to be an input for our uh, experiment. And also the probability of the injury evolving into a fatality. It will depend on uh, two uh, principal uh, parameters, the characteristic of the drone, the size, the speed, uh, the kinematic energy when it hits uh, to a person. And also it will depend on the sheltering factor that it is used to quantify how protective people are when the UEF follow over them. And these two, um, two data is going to be an input for our model, for our simulations. 
please, next, uh, Dominic. Here, uh, well, as Dominic said, uh, our ultimate goal with uh, our experiment is obtain the maximum capacity of the iron of the air space, but for that we have developed different uh, scenario and uh, experiment to uh, study the impact that different uh, parameters have in the in the collision risk. And here they are presented. Uh, first, uh, the tactical conflict resolution service. Uh, we have tested two different setups. Uh, if we don't apply the US space service, uh, in this case all the potential collision will occur. And if we um, use the US space service, uh, some of these collisions can be detected and avoid. Of course, the ability of detecting and avoiding this collision will depend on the positioning update rate, the navigation accuracy, and also uh, depends on the conflict margin uh, we consider to detect a conflict before um, they evolve into a collision. Uh, regarding positioning update rate, uh, this is how often the position of the UAF is reported. Uh, we have tested uh, three setups, every one second, every three seconds, and every five seconds. Uh, regarding navigation accuracy, this is the navigation error in the reported position to the uh, US space system, and we have tested uh, two different setups, GPS L1 and SBAS Augmented GPS. If, and for that, um, we have considered the nominal position that it is the position that the UAF report to the system, but the real position uh, is different because uh, an error in this position um, is introduced and we have simulated that uh, following a normal distribution. Then uh, regarding the conflict margin, uh, I have uh, talked about a collision, but we also consider conflict because uh, if we can detect conflict, uh, we can avoid in the future the potential collisions. So uh, we have tested also three setups, uh, a conflict margin of three meters, uh, five meters, and also uh, 10 meters. And uh, lately, um, we have also uh, considered different overflow areas because it will have an impact in the number of fatalities on the ground, as I said before. So uh, we have uh, tested different setups um, flying over big cities, medium cities and small cities with low, medium and high sheltering factor. Then I'm going to present it the different experiment we have developed and the principal highlight we obtain. Please, Dominic. Uh, here in the first scenario, we have considered uh, what is the collision risk reduction uh, the US space tactical conflict resolution service introduced. So here in the first column, we can see um, well, and here we have uh, presented different update rate. So the one second, three second, and five second. This is the time uh, between the uh, the sorry, the position reports. So without US space system, it has no effect because uh, we are going to consider that all the potential all the potential of collision will occur since we don't have a system to avoid them. But if we consider uh, the US space system, we can see that uh, the higher the update rate, the lower the collision risk. See, because if we have a, a we have uh, the, uh, the position uh, report uh, every one second. We have the ability to avoid uh, most of the collisions. Then in the next scenario, in second, yeah. Here uh, we have tested the impact of the navigation accuracy on the conflict detection rate and the remaining collision risk. Um, Regarding the collision detection, detection rate, uh, the navigation accuracy will have a very huge impact because one is the nominal position that this is the one reported to the system and the 
the real position is not the same. So sometimes we are going to detect some uh, conflict that they are not going to evolve in collision. And um, on the other hand, we are going to have some collision that we are not able to detect. Here uh, we can see in the first two columns that with uh, when we um, make the conflict margin uh, higher, we can detect more collisions. So the conflict, uh, the collision rate uh, decrease because uh, we can detect uh, all of them with larger conflict margin. And also we can see in the middle of the table that with a larger uh, conflict margin, we can detect uh, almost all the collision that are going to occur. So uh, seeing that uh, result, we can think that the better solution is having a very, very large uh, conflict margin. But the problem is that with a very large conflict margin, we are going to have a large number also of false conflict, as we can see in the right part of the table with a T, a 10 meters collision margin, we have a, a large number of false conflicts. So it's going to make the system inefficient. So taking that into account, we consider that the best solution is having a five meters conflict margin and GPS plus SBAS uh, regarding the navigation accuracy. Then uh, last, uh, since our ultimate goal is estimate the capacity here, uh, we presented different uh, result. Uh, we have uh, tested uh, the collision, uh, the number of fatalities to third parties on ground in different uh, overflow uh, areas. Uh, Madrid, for example, that is a very large city with high population density from Madrid, uh, then Toulouse and then uh, finish it with Toledo, that is a, a small city here in Spain. And we can see that without UTM system, we can not almost uh, fly even in Toledo because uh, the, the collision risk is really, really high. But if we introduce a UTM system with GPS L1, for example, we can uh, fly seven UAS per square kilometer, for example, in the outer skirts of Toledo. And if we use GPS with SBAS, uh, we can fly even in Toulouse outer skirts. Of course, uh, seven UAFs per square kilometer is not very much, but uh, we have to take into account that this is a um, result without any structure, any um, measure to keep the the drones uh, separate from themselves so the we expect that introducing some rest restriction we uh, are going to be able to uh, increase this capacity so that's all uh, dominic thank you very much uh, marina for for this overview and uh, i would like to just summarize many of the points that marina just mentioned so that you can sort of have them in your head of what are the principal results that we've uh, we've obtained uh, with with our work so first of course we found that you would need to provide tactical deconfliction to substantially have an impact on collision risk as we did see that without providing any type of use space uh, services in this regard uh, the risk of collision would just not allow for any type of UAV operations. So it was great to see that confirmed. We also found that one second position update rates uh, would be beneficial in order to substantially increase the conflict prevention in particular in very capacity or area constrained environments. And uh, of course, a higher precision accuracy would be preferred. Uh, so in this case, having a delta of one meter uh, precision inaccuracy would, would be sufficient, um, which can only really be achieved with SPAS augmented GPS and within a five to 10 meter conflict uh, margin range that uh, Marina just explained. As also Marina just uh, mentioned, the sweet spot for between UAV position accuracy and minimizing false conflicts is at a conflict margin of roughly five meters. And then to summarize all of this into our initial, initial goal for identifying a sort of capacity value, a, a threshold value. Well, as Marina mentioned, we found that you can fit seven UAVs per square kilometer 
in an area with a population density of roughly 5,500 inhabitants per square kilometers, um, which sort of corresponds to the city of Toulouse uh, with a very high sheltering factor, as is the case in the outskirts of the city. And we can increase this value uh, to a city the size of Toledo, which has a population density of 600 inhabitants per square kilometer. Now, the last part of our presentation, I would like to address some of the asterisks that are uh, that are pending with uh, with these results. First and foremost, one of the limitations is that here we are only considering collision risk, right? So if you remember back the model that I mentioned at the beginning, we also have um, societal impact uh, as another factor, for instance, as well as mission efficiency and so on. So if we include these elements into this uh, definition, we will likely have a reduction in the capacity values because there are more limitations than just collision risk. On the other hand, we're also considering only small UAS and only one particular type of UAV. I also saw in the questions that this was a question that was uh, coming up. We've only considered a specific type of UAV. We haven't gone into certified UAVs or a mix between several UAVs and urban air mobility or even the introduction of, uh, of manned aviation is out of the study uh, at this point in time. So this would also decrease this capacity threshold value probably substantially. On the other hand, this is also something that Maria pointed, uh, Marina pointed out, is that uh, there are no DCB processes in place, meaning that at, with this value, we don't have any sort of strategic deconfliction, nor do we have any sort of airspace structuring to increase these capacity values. So essentially what we're left with here is a baseline value. This is a value that we're, going, we're using in our ongoing studies as a reference. Um, to see if we can improve uh, over what we've found so far with sort of this sort of basic uh, assessment of uh, safety within the city. So as you can also imagine, uh, there are lots, there's lots of room for improvement. Um, here, just to list a few things that can be improved. Um, some of the comments that we got also when reviewing was, of course, the inclusion of onboard collision avoidance schemes. So this would also be relatively important. We would also need to incorporate strategic deconfliction of trajectories, airspace structuring, as well as different types of UAV missions and UAV vehicles, general aviation, as well as refine a bit our risk modeling methods to be more applicable to some of the geometries in which these aircraft will be uh, operating within. Uh, also, varying separation standards may apply depending on the area that you're that you're working in. This is in particular given by sort of the regulatory aspects of, of providing use space within urban areas. And also, we need to incorporate uh, participation and wind, which is something that, of course, these small vehicles are very much affected by. And look into also the use space system performance as a whole and how that affects uh, our collision risk uh, in total. Everything that is marked here in blue, I wanted to highlight because these are things that we are addressing in DACUS, but given that this was our first experiment and we're right now in the phase of conducting several other experiments, these will be addressed uh, as we speak, actually. We're performing these uh, during this month and we can expect some final results uh, on these uh, elements by mid-2022. So definitely keep uh, up to date on the DACUS project. I've provided here the link for, for the website as well, where, where we usually um, post our, our most recent findings. And of course, feel free to uh, be in contact with either myself or with Marina for any type of question concerning the presentation. So that is uh, all for now. I think we can go into the Q&A. Thank you very much. So thank you, Marina and Dominic. We're almost out of time for the, for the Q&A, but I would still like to at least uh, you know, try to bundle. We had quite a few questions about the, the there's an essential assumption um, in in your you know in all this work about the performance of the of the conflict detection and resolution. So just to be clear, you said here in the last slide there is no um, onboard DAA. It's just the the service. And is that how does a collision happen? Let's say is that only dependent on the accuracy of the navigation in the sense that the U space service uh, that's, that's detecting if they don't know where the drones really are that turns into a conflict, or is there also another potential conflict that, sorry, crash does not because of, of the inaccuracy of the navigation? Uh, Marina, can you take this one? Yes, sorry. Um, well, uh, we have considered uh, only the navigation accuracy and also the time the UAF needs need to uh, to receive the alert and then avoid the the collision but of course uh, this is a preliminary uh, study so of course they are going to be more um, 
parameters that will affect the ability of the drone and also the system to detect and be able to avoid the, the collisions. Okay, so that it it, would it be fair to say that the these values that you gave very concrete values of the performance, oh, sorry, of the capacity that would be estimated is very dependent on the performance of the, the of the in the end of the combined separation and detect and avoid. And um, so yeah. another question we had was about the square, you know, values per square kilometer, and and actually um, space is three D. So um, yeah. it would make a difference whether the drones are different heights or. So how would you? Yeah, yeah. See, si, yes. Uh, we have considered uh, 150 meters of height, and these values are uh, considering that the drones are uh, uniformly uh, distributed uh, in different age. And um, along another... these uh, 100.5 uh, me uh, meters. Sorry, yes. No, thank you. Just. I think that because of you came with this very concrete results, uh, that's why we have, uh, you know, so many questions about the the assumptions. Another question was what happens with the velocity of the drones. You mentioned on the last slide that you would be considering different drones. Was there like what was the assumption in terms of the speed of the drones and how would increasing the speed and increasing their, therefore the closure rate, uh, how would that impact the, these values? Yeah. Uh, for now, uh, we are just considering small drones, and uh, we are uh, we are focusing on a strategic phase. So we are generating random scenarios with uh, with velocities uh, from zero uh, to uh, 25 meters um, per second, and uh, when we simulate the scenarios, the these the drones can have uh, any of these. Uh, a speed uh, randomly chosen. But of course, uh, in the future, uh, we can introduce the, the a concrete speed or different type of drones. And regarding the, the, the rate uh, to the collision, we consider the time, not a, a speed, not distance, sorry. So uh, the, we, we consider that we need some time and this time will um, need more or less distance depending on the velocity of the drones, of course. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, like, like I said, all the papers and, and presentations will be available. And uh, I think our, uh, our uh, presenters, I'm sorry that we, we have to stop here because we have, a, I think, a teaser yeah. coming up, but uh, they have offered. So do contact them if you have more questions, suggestions yes. uh, uh, for the for the follow up work. I just to confirm, DACUS is one of our CSR projects that's currently ongoing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Olivia. Bye. And thank you. Thank all. you very much. So I, I think we now have some, some teasers coming up.
So, Brahma, I'm not sure about about the rest. I I no, really the, the teaser the teaser is coming. There is a, a slight a slight. All right. 